morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're here. This is a morning. Uh, As I uh, drove to church, I thought, uh, boy, it's so dark. This would be an easy day to sleep in. But I'm glad you're here this morning, and uh, welcome to St. Joe. A couple of things. Make sure today that you sign a connection card. Let us know that you're here. You can find those at the back of the room if you don't have one now. Also, we are beginning an Advent series. This is the first Sunday of the Christian year. And uh, so last Sunday was Christ the King Sunday. That's the last Sunday of the year. This is the first Sunday. We begin to celebrate, prepare for the God who comes. I run into a lot of people who wonder where God is and who God is and what God is like. And in Advent, we find out. He shows up, so that's a good thing. And we're in the middle of a sermon series. We're starting a sermon series called Generation to Generation. There is an Advent Bible study we're going to offer, and uh, it's called Light of the World. There are copies of the book back in the left corner on that table if you want to take one. And in, during the service, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet uh, for the Bible study. We'll have our first meeting this Wednesday at 6.30 in the evening. And then uh, we will have for the next following three Sundays, we'll meet at 4.30 in the afternoon. Okay, so the really interesting thing about the writer of the study is she is probably one of the two or three best uh, Bible scholars in America, and she's Jewish. And so when it comes to symbolism and names and all of that, she's able to help us understand some parts of the Advent story that you may have missed. So uh, Wednesday, 6.30, and uh, come uh, through the office entrance. I think that is B. Is that B? And uh, we'll let you know where we're going to be, but I think we'll probably be in here. That depends on the, ch the chairs and the seating. But so uh, sign up, we'll pass around a sign up sheet for this. <laughs> also, there's a men's breakfast here on Saturday morning, the 17th of December at eight o'clock in the morning. And on the sign up sheet that uh, we'll pass around, there's also a sign up sheet for that. So if you're a guy uh, and you're going to come to that, sign uh, up for the men's breakfast. We'll have a little music. Um, it'll be in the gymnasium, then we'll move to the sanctuary. Um, that's where the music will be. And then uh, the pastor at Auburn, who's a big tall guy who was on the Appalachian Trail this year, is going to talk about what it means to be a man and to journey with God, on the trail with God. So that's the 17th and we'll be done by 9.30. On Christmas Eve, we'll have worship services here at 3 seven and 11 and at the Y, I believe it is five o'clock, four o'clock, four o'clock. So you've got a lot of options, four o'clock at the Y or three o'clock, seven o'clock, 11 o'clock here at Reed Road. Two last announcements, are you ready? I don't know how many that is, but I think I'm almost near my limit. Um, on December 3rd, that's next weekend, at seven o'clock, an amazing group, King's Brass, will be here at Reed Road. And so uh, for me personally, one of the ways that I get ready for uh, Christmas and Advent is music. And so I would invite you to invite your friends to the concert, King's Brass. You'll see uh, posters around the building December 3rd at seven o'clock. And uh, if you come to that, we'll invite you to offer uh, to give an offering to support their visit. And then next Sunday morning, our service here will actually be in the sanctuary. And uh, a group called Smooth Edge 2, an acapella group, will be here to lead us. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Okay, so there's just a lot of stuff. I'm not giving you all of December, but those are some of the things that are coming our way. I'm confident I'm forgetting something. I, I always do. Huh? Oh, do we have a video? Okay, let's have a video.
Smooth Edge 2, we're going to do a concert for you guys. We are going to be performing on Sunday, December 4th. We're excited to join you for both services. And we hope to see you there. Bye -bye. See you guys! Okay. Good morning again. I'd like to invite you to pray with me. And uh, I think after we do that, I'm going to invite you to greet one another. Okay. And then the praise team will be uh, leading us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your presence with us. Uh, in the middle of the holidays, they are in many ways a blessing to us and they bring joy to our hearts. And and then for others of us, God, they're really difficult. So we're thankful, God, that you are with us, that you meet us here on this quiet morning. As we move into the season of Advent, begin to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our lives for your Advent here among us. We give you thanks. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would heal the broken places, that you would lift up the places where we are down, and that you would straighten out the crooked places in the world. We give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to come together as your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd invite you to stand up and, uh, and greet one another this morning and say good morning, okay? And then we'll be led in worship. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning, Carol. I don't know. All right, good morning. Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to be here this morning. And obviously, you're all excited to be here this morning. I can tell by the, by the amount of um, conversation going on relative to the number of people. So uh, that's a good thing. Let's stand and let's, uh, let's worship together. Where you go, I'll go. Where you say, I'll say. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Follow you. 
I might, I'm going to continue to worship. I'm going to remember a God who moves mountains for us. So today, as Pastor Mark mentioned, is uh, the first Sunday of Advent, and also the first year of the new year of the church calendar. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! So it is the uh, beginning of Advent, and so today we will light the first Advent candle. Uh, the first candle of Advent is the candle of hope, or the candle of prophecy. 
In Isaiah 7, 14, it states, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, and the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. The people of Israel were waiting, filled with hope based on the prophecy in Isaiah. We remember that hope as we enter Advent. We remember how God kept his promise through Mary, and how we celebrate that time through the lighting of this first Advent candle, the candle of hope. We wait with hopeful hearts, just as they did 2,000 years ago. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. It's that time in our service now when we gather together as a body. We celebrate the things that we're joyful for. We give thanks to God for the many blessings that he gives us. And we lift up those areas in our life where we need prayer. And so as we gather now for this time, I ask, are there any things that we're joyful for, things that we're thankful for, and things where we need prayer? Jordan. Okay, so prayers for Alan as he uh, goes through dialysis. I have a father who goes through dialysis as well, so uh, I understand the challenges that he'll be facing. Other joys, concerns? It's a joy to spend time with family and celebrating Thanksgiving and uh, rekindling relationships and seeing people we haven't seen in a while. Yes, we were able to do that this week as well. I've, I'm sure many of you were able to get together with family this week. I hope you were anyway. And, and just spend that time uh, reconnecting and, and being a family. Yes? Well, again, uh, another one thing I'm enjoying for is on my birthday is that it shoots after Christmas. So upcoming birthdays, upcoming celebrations, uh, definitely a thing to be joyful for. Sarah? And you're here in one piece, too, yes. so that's another joy. So, okay, guys. All right, well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning, we are, we are just so thankful for the many ways that you bless us, for the opportunity to gather as families and to reconnect and rekindle those relationships that, uh, that we don't always get to spend as much time on as we would like. Father, we are thankful for that blessing, for the blessing of, of high school students gathering, gathering to celebrate you and to celebrate your love. Father, that is truly a joyous occasion, a joyous moment, and we are so thankful for that. For celebrations, uh, personal celebrations, birthdays, family gatherings like Thanksgiving, uh, upcoming gatherings like Christmas. Father, we are so thankful for those opportunities to, to connect and to celebrate. And Father, for the many health concerns that, uh, that are just prevalent throughout the congregation, some that were mentioned, people going on to dialysis or uh, just people dealing with other health issues. Father, you know what those are. So we just pray that you will be with those people. Give them your strength. Give them your courage to face the challenges that they face and give them your peace that they will know that you are with them and that you will provide for them in whatever way you see fit. And so, Father, we ask all of this in the name of the, the one who came down for us, the one whose birth we are preparing to celebrate. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
I'm going to uh, I'm going to hand this uh, sign-up sheet to Jason and just start passing it around. And, and uh, it's for the Advent Bible Study of the Men's Breakfast. And uh, if you want to come, come. So this morning we're going to read a passage passage of scripture that I almost always avoid, okay? <clears throat> and as I was growing up, I would just jump right over this to get to the good stuff. So it's the genealogy of Jesus by Matthew in the first chapter. And as I come to this to read it, I think about the Sunday I had a Southland police officer read a text like this. Big, tall guy, he worked out with the Notre Dame backfield. And uh, as he began to read through the text, he slowed down, and he would hesitate, and then he would keep going. And when the reading was done, he looked across the chancel at me, and he said this after the reading, I'll get you back for this. <laughs> That's what he said. But here's the genealogy of Jesus. A record of the ancestors of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Aram. Aram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Are you still with me? <laughs> Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asaph. Asaph was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Joram. Joram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Still with me? Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amos. Amos was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers. This was at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, uh, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, Abiud was the father of Eliakim, Eliakim was the father of Azor, Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok was the father of Achim, Achim was the father of Eliud, Eliud was the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan was the father of Jacob. Still with me? Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. So there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 generations from the exile to Babylon to the Christ. If someone were to ask you who you were and what your story is, my hunch is that at some point you would begin to talk about your people. Right? So you might talk about dates and you might talk about where you've lived and you might talk about what you do or what you did do to make a living, but eventually you're going to talk about your people. I've always jumped over uh, the genealogy in Matthew. I've always done that. I've always, you know, first of all, it was just a mouthful. And then secondly, I wanted to get to the good stuff. But then when you slow down and you look at the genealogy in Matthew, you have some surprises. And uh, it's not just something to jump over. Now, it's interesting. Did you notice in Matthew whether he traces the line of Jesus through Joseph or Mary? Did you notice? It's Joseph. And so he was writing to Jewish Christians, and <clears throat> he wants to make something very clear, that the prophecy that Jesus would come from the line of David 
is true. Uh, and also, as uh, a man writing in a patriarchal society, he leaves out a lot of the women's stories. So that's just the time and the, and the, the age. He doesn't tell a lot of the women's stories. He tells some, but not all. So if you were to ask me about me and my story, I'd begin to talk about my people. I would uh, talk about my mom and dad, how they were uh, graduates of Ball State and they fell in love, how they both felt that they had heard a call from God and how they went to Africa. I'd tell you about my dad who died at the age of 27 and is buried in a place called Wombonyama. I'd tell you about how his students manually compressed his chest all night as he was dying of vulvar polio. And I'd tell you about how he asked his students, someone to read Psalm 121 to him as he died. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. <clears throat> I'd tell you about how my mom came back to the States with me. She was seven months pregnant, so sick she almost died. <clears throat> I'd tell you about my grandma and grandpa Owen, my maternal grandparents who in a small house on the near east side of Indianapolis took us in. They actually gave us their bedroom so that the largest bedroom in that small house is the place where my mother, my little brother Eric and I live. Also in a tiny bedroom right next to us, my great grandparents and my great, uh, my great grandma and grandpa lived. Believe it, three families under that one roof i tell you about them. i tell you about my grandpa who, uh, when he was a young man, lost his job because he worked for a bank at Vincent's in 1929. How they made ends meet by, he did the books in different businesses in town, and together they had a small orchestra. And they would go out and they would play at county schools and churches, and that's how they meet, made ends meet. I tell you about uh, how he cackled when he laughed. I tell you about how he loved the Presbyterian Church and the Republican Party. And I tell you how he couldn't find a, a note to save his life when he sang in church. In fact, it was so embarrassing. It was like listening to a wild animal that backed into a fence post. And I tell you about my grandma and how she cooked the life out of green beans and how she could make an upright piano dance. I tell you how he used to walk, but waving his arms, walking fast. When I walk fast, I suddenly realize I need to slow down. I realize that Bill Owen is still walking with me. He had these big bushy eyebrows. Every time I look in a mirror, I see my grandpa looking back at me. <clears throat> so I talk about my people. I talk about uh, how uh, uh, a young uh, IU medical student named Bob Finstermacher met my grandfather one night. My grandfather was in a hospital looking for a blanket to keep his mother, my great-grandmother, warm. And in a nearly empty hospital wing, looked for a blanket, someone to help him find a blanket. <clears throat> Found this young medical student uh, by the name of Bob Finstermacher. And, uh, as he got a blanket for my grandfather to give to my great-grandmother, this young medical student said, I've always wanted to go to Africa as a missionary. And so my grandfather said, why don't you come to our house? I'd tell you about Bob Finstermacher, how the night he proposed to my mom, he also asked at the same time if he could be our father and if he could adopt Eric and me. I'd tell you about Africa. I'd tell you about the time he stood over an open grave was asked to answer a question that would either start a tribal war or end a tribal war. I tell you about the time we had to leave our home and, and uh, be airlifted out and leave all that behind. I tell you about Alaska, what it was like to live there on the edge of the world. And my dad loved to paint with watercolors. He was a great chess player. And my mom could preach like an angel, and she was always 10 minutes late. And she loved jewelry, good jewelry, bad jewelry. It didn't matter. She liked it. 
like her mom, like her sister. I tell you about my people. I tell you the good stories because that's what you'd tell somebody who'd say, tell me about your people. You'd tell the good stories, wouldn't you? And then there are other stories, aren't there? Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> so after a while, you know, maybe by the time I had my third Coke Zero with you, if you asked me about my people and my family and my story, I'd, I'd begin to tell you other stories. And uh, I'd tell you the story of uh, someone who would give you the shirt off their back, but who for a short while was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And I tell you a story about someone who was uh, chased by the mafia, arrested by the federal government for fraud, uh, ran to Central America and became the personal friend of a dictator. That's another story. Or I tell you about a family member who took a shot at their husband when he came through the bedroom window at 2.30 in the morning. And uh, she missed. But the family story is that he got the point and he never did that again. <laughs> and I tell you the story of somebody who loved God very much, but who died angry at God, feeling like God had let her down. I tell you the good stories. I tell you the bad stories. And you'd begin to know me and know my story. So Matthew tells the story of Jesus, and, and when you look at this list, you begin to slow down a little bit, and that's one of the things I've tried to share with you. The Bible begins to speak with incredible power when we slow down, and so you begin to look at this list, and so Abraham was the father of Isaac. You know, Abraham, who is the, who is the example of faith, right? I mean, even Paul says that. Paul says that Abraham had such faith in God that God said to Abraham, your faith is so strong that your faith is your righteousness. And Abraham is the man, he and Sarah, who late in life when God said go, went, picked up, left their family behind, traveled hundreds of miles to the west. That's, that's Abraham. But then there's another side to the Abraham story. You know it. I think. When he goes down into Egypt and his wife is beautiful and the Egyptians notice her and he, he lies to them. He tells them that Sarah is his sister and she ends up in the harem of the king. And so she becomes a part of the harem of Pharaoh and while she's in the harem of Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh wants to bless Abraham because he's delighted with how beautiful this woman is. And so he gives Abraham everything Abraham could ever dream of. And this little petty tribal chief becomes a huge, powerful, rich, nomadic tribesman. So there's a, Abraham and Sarah, their story is wonderful and filled with faith. And that's also a story of lying and deception. Right off the bat. He was the father of Isaac. Isaac is the child who they waited for and waited for and waited for. And, and when Abraham, the, his father said, let's go up to the top of the mountain and let's, let's offer a sacrifice to God. Isaac, young Isaac, says, let's go, Dad, in absolute faith. Jacob was the father of Judah. Judah was... Uh, do it by the book kind of guy, follow all the rules kind of guy. I think kind of harsh, kind of self-righteous. And then his daughter-in-law, who was a widow, tricked him into sleeping with her because he was going to cut her off from the family, he wasn't going to support her. And so she tricked him into sleeping with her and out of that union was born twin daughters. What kind of family is this? What kind of family is this? 
keep reading down. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. You know the story of David, right? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Scripture says David always had a heart for God. And he unified the two kingdoms. And he made Jerusalem the capital city. And he led Israel in battle. And then one day when he was successful and at the top of his game, he noticed a friend's wife bathing on the roof. And there was an act of betrayal, and out of the act of betrayal, there were lies, and then he saw to it that her husband was killed. And the baby born to David and Bathsheba died, but then later, a child was born, born named Solomon. And he was a great king, he had the gift of wisdom, but he couldn't handle a pretty face. He couldn't handle a pretty face. And so any beautiful woman just caused this great king with all this wisdom to go off the rails. And he read his own press notices and he couldn't stop building magnificent buildings until he had nearly bankrupted the kingdom. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon, this great king whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. What kind of family is this? Uzziah. Uzziah. You know the story of Uzziah? Uzziah was a great king. A long, long reign. He was extraordinary. He led the nation through a time of prosperity. He was a gifted military leader and actually led uh, the army of his people over uh, the Arabs and uh, other countries. Everything he touched turned to gold. And the problem, though, was success. You know what the problem with success is? Success. Success. And so after a while, everything he touches turns to gold, and he decides that he doesn't need priests or preachers, that he can control God the way he controls everybody else. And so King Uzziah, at the top of his game, marches into the temple and decides to burn incense to the Lord God Yahweh. He doesn't need a priest. He doesn't need a preacher. And I think the problem is he thinks he can control God the way he controls everybody else. And the Bible tells us that as he burns the incense to God and tosses the priests and preachers aside and says to God, almost like you would to an errand boy, come give me what I want. At that very moment, the curtain of the temple is torn in two, and sunlight finds the face of Uzziah, and in that moment, his face is covered with leprosy. So I don't know what you make of a story like that. It may be a reminder, the Bible's reminder to us, that when you think you can control everything and even control God, when you decide you don't need anyone, you don't need to listen to anyone, but you have all the answers, that you are in a dangerous, broken place. What kind of family is this? So I'm kind of curious, why do you think Matthew includes this whole story? Why do you think that's in the Bible? Because you're all looking at me like, why did I get out of bed for this? <laughs> why do you think Matthew has that in the Bible? Well, maybe it's to show us that Jesus does in fact come from the line of David, which is what the prophet Isaiah had predicted hundreds and hundreds of years before. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe Matthew wants us to know 
that he was one of us. You know, I've got to tell you, uh, I have much, I, I meet people who have a much greater struggle with the idea that God became flesh than that Jesus was divine. And people just say, well, he looked divine, he looked, uh, looked human, but he really, you know, wasn't human. But maybe it's Matthew's way of saying, do you know what? He was like one of us. He was one of us. His family looked as beautiful, as wonderful, and as crazy as your family. Or maybe Matthew has this list of names here to let us know that there's room for your story in the story of God. There's a place for you. About six or seven years ago, maybe longer, eight years ago, a granddaughter of Ella was playing with a really inexpensive little necklace that belonged to my wife, Shannon. And Ella would have been maybe five or six years old. So it would have been now, it would have been nine years ago. And as she was playing with this necklace in Bloomington, uh, and uh, Sharon had said, sure, sweetheart, you know, as she played with it, what do you think happened? It broke. It broke. And that little girl just dissolved. She just and my wife put her arms around her and she let her know that it was okay and let her know that it wasn't a big problem and it wasn't that expensive. But again, before they left to go back to Columbus, Ella wept. I'm so sorry. So Sharon did a beautiful job of letting her know she was loved and forgiven. Lo and behold, they came back about six or seven weeks later and Ella dissolved in tears again. I'm so sorry. And Sharon let her know again that the love was deep enough and wide enough. That it was okay. It's okay. So maybe Matthew has this whole list of names to let us know that there's room for our story in the story of Jesus and that there is in fact a love that makes room for us. Maybe. Or maybe it's Matthew's way of saying, you know, the world's kind of a mess and you're kind of a mess and I'm kind of a mess and God still comes. God still comes. So I want to, uh, before we're done this morning, there's a, there's a little section in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah says that there'll come a time when uh, the people of the world will look to the mountain of the Lord, and that would be when he refers in Isaiah 2 to the mountain of the Lord, he's referring to the Temple Mount, and that's where the temple in Jerusalem is built. Now, the Bible would make you think that uh, Judea, which is kind of a rocky highland, that where the temple was, was the highest mountain of all. But the reality is, if you ever go to Jerusalem, or if you've ever been there, and you stood on the Mount of Olives, you actually look down at the hill where the temple is built. It's not actually the tallest. And what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 2 is this. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills, he says. There'll be a time when God's house is higher than every other house. And people will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, come, let us go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that God may teach us God's ways and we may walk in God's paths. What Isaiah says to us is this, God comes to us not to love us so we can continue in the mess, but God comes to love us so that we can change and have a new start. So God comes to us in Jesus, not just to love us in the mess, but God comes with a love that will help us out of the mess. It will help us change. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can't bear the news. I don't know if you do that. There are days when I just can't read the headline when I pull the paper up on my phone. 
There are days when I cannot bear the thought of one more shooting. I can't stand it. I don't understand it. I don't know why as a society we're willing to live in a world where children have to go to school prepared for mass shooting events. Why do we tolerate that? Why is that okay? And there are moments when I'm just dumbfounded by the greed of humanity, uh, and not just billionaires, but me too. And there are times when I can't bear to read one more article about melting ice caps or the disappearing rainforest. I can't bear it. And Isaiah says, there'll come a time when people in the world look to God and say, maybe our answers aren't the answer and maybe God's answers are a better way. So maybe one of the reasons why uh, Matthew gives us this long list and why Isaiah says what Isaiah says is maybe there's going to be a time when we'll get tired of our answers and say, let's go to God and try God's way. So I wonder, you know, when do we get tired enough of our answers and the way they aren't answers at all to look to God for God's answers? I wonder when. One of the coolest things, I have a friend whose uh, son is a tattoo artist, actually, here in Fort Wayne. And one of the cool things he does, and he's not alone in this, is periodically he donates his time to take tattoos, remove tattoos from people. Have you heard about this? Uh, there have been national stories, especially in Los Angeles, with gangs. And uh, it's quite a movement, so tattoo artists give their time, and people have been in a gang or they may have the inward tattooed up to one side and down the other, or they may have really uh, gross images of women or whatever it is, or uh, symbolism that has to do with drugs. And, and these guys, these women decide to get clean. They decide to change their lives. And so they come to these tattoo artists and they ask for this stuff to be removed because they want to live a different way. I love that story. And I think one of the things that Isaiah is saying to us is that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah comes to love us. There's room for our story in the story of Jesus. But he comes with a love that invites us to turn away from the old way, the painful way, and to try God's way. It's quite a list of names, isn't it? Quite a list of names. There's room for your story in the story of Jesus. And even though he sees who we are and how the world is, he still comes. Will you pray with me? We're thankful for your story, Jesus. We're thankful for the names and the lives. We're thankful for those who got it right, even though there were times when they got it wrong. There are moments, Jesus, when we feel as if the moments when we've gotten it wrong disqualify us. And somehow this amazing story of your advent among us, your coming into the world, that somehow maybe it's not for us because we struggle. We have struggled, and we're sure not perfect. But in this list of names, we discover, God, that you continue to work in and through people who are so imperfect. You love them, you continue to work, and you don't give up on them. So remind us today, God, that there's room for us in our story, in the story of Jesus. And help us as a nation and as a church and as individuals to look to the mountain of the Lord and say, let's go to God's house 
that God might teach us God's ways and we might walk in God's paths. We pray this in the name of the carpenter, our master, our teacher and friend. Copies of there are copies of the uh, 
Bible study book back on the table at the back of the room to your in the left corner, my left corner. And uh, if you haven't signed up for the Bible study yet, do that or the men's breakfast. And remember, next Saturday evening is King's Brass here at St. Joe. And we hope to be in the sanctuary. Uh, and that depends on how the furnace work goes this week. I'm really glad you're here. Make sure you linger for a time of coffee out in the hallway before you go home, unless you want to run home and eat more turkey. And, uh, and I'm so glad you're here. We send you out as God's beloved children into a world that seems uncertain. And yet the love of God for us and all humanity is certain. Go from this place in the love of God. Go from this place in hope, in faith, in love, and in joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of all life, go in peace. Amen. This is a move. This is a move.